Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Join us on benpokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. So, my arm, so if you don't now, Justin, your how are you? <laughs> we want to get Justin. We'll get our own podcast. Yeah. Another time. No, you can Fuck take you, you can take the steering wheel. Take the steering wheel, and you can go that way. Okay. No one ever talks to Justin. Nobody likes him really. I don't know yeah, what it is. So, <laughs> it's actually, he's. You want to know something funny? He's the most loved host on he my. He is. He's serious. Yeah. He's, he's the favorite. No, because so, they just keep waiting, you know, for the opportunity, <laughs> and uh, so sometimes remember, it comes. remember that thing that sticky you brought it last time I was in, in California. How's that? Yes, going well? uh, it's not going well. It's T- not tell me about it. Tell me about it. No, so this is this has been a big learning process for me too. So uh, I was actually going to ask you because um, what you had just mentioned as far as like um, starting something and then finishing something, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Blessing and a curse, right? I'm gonna sometimes this, you start something and right. you're like, should I probably should just get the fuck out of here, but I'm, I'm attached to this. So I'm, I'm spinning this question right back onto you uh, because when do you know when to abandon a project? I don't... <laughs> yeah. I don't know the answer. I struggle with the same thing. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, dude. Sometimes you just gotta know when to, you know, sever know it. when to fold right. them. <laughs> but so, uh, but I don't, listen, man. Ask. I guess the best advice is ask some people who, um, who you respect and say, mm-hmm. man, who you know won't bullshit you and say, hey, man, is this good or is this shit? Right. Because if it's if it's good, then you gotta pursue it. Because if it's if it's from an altruistic place of like the world needs this because it's gonna be a better place. Yeah. You got to do it, man. And, and if it, it's like people go, man, it's it's you could you've done better or you could do better, then mm-hmm. fucking walk away, right? Yeah. And that's uh, how I, f- I I have feel that, and I've I've gone through that process of it being something that would definitely benefit um, people from a rehabilitation perspective, from performance, from all these different avenues. But it's something that, um, it, you know, and I I was challenged. I know like some of the guys, and I ask Adam, I ask. Sal this constantly because I totally trust them as um, other, um, you know, business, um, you know, mentors of mine on, on a lot of levels. So, um, you know, going through that process, it was tough, man. It, it's tough because you, you, you see the vision of it, you see what it could potentially do, and, mm-hmm. but then you see the monstrous side of that business being way bigger and uh, more moving parts than I feel like yeah, man. Um, deserves the the energy, the sure. attention, the time that it will take to to really foster and develop. So there's, there's a lot of beauty there, man. Because like you know, everything I tell people when you're starting a business, when you're starting any endeavor, is it's going to take ten times as much as you think. Whatever you plan for, ten exit because it's so much more than you think. And you know, speaking to you know the when to quit thing. Um, so I had $321,000 embezzled from my business. Holy shit. Oh, oh shit. And, that's uh, a lot of money embezzled. Mm-hmm. And um, I walked away hmm. because it was the type of thing where uh, it was going to cost me at least that much to get it back. And it sounds fucking dumb. And maybe it is. <laughs> but it was like the stress and the time. You're right. Gonna, it costs you more than that, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and would I have made double back? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, rather than going after someone like, so your first response is I'm going to fucking murder somebody. Mm-hmm. And then you get over the irrationality of that and go, what? Well, get me anywhere. So uh, then you go, what am I going to do? I'm going to sue somebody. Like, who am I going to sue? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you try to you know, try to go after the is bank. Is that worth your energy? Yeah, yeah. So you got to decide, man. Like, how much more are you going to have to put into it? How much more time and more money? And, mm-hmm. you know, and I have a question for you guys. Mm-hmm. How do you, and this may, you can answer this in any way. How do you continue to have a great relationship amongst the three of you guys when, when <laughs> you've spent so much time together? That's probably one of the most common things we get asked. Yeah, oh, we get I guess, asked a lot. Easy, sure. easy answer. We take baths together <laughs> regularly. <laughs> Circle jerk. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just the bath. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, we yeah. don't touch. We yeah, don't yeah, touch yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, I handle myself. You, yeah. Do you guys get along? Very well. Yeah. yeah. Very, we fight a lot. It's too, interesting. Yeah, it's we just seem dynamic. Yeah, we're we're hundred percent without a doubt. We are family for sure. Um, and we, so how do you, how do you keep the finances out of it? Cause uh, I feel because like money is not the major motivator for us. Yeah. We are all, so no, this, not give me the real answer. Do you want it? We'll no, no, really. I, and I'm a very, <laughs> I'm you. a very money yeah, motivated yeah. person yeah. for sure. I am. Uh, but we are all 37, 38, 39 years old. So where we're at in our life now, we all imagine meeting 
two or three other buddies where you're at in your journey right now and deciding to go on a venture together, we there's a lot that's happened with the the four of us sure. before we all got together. It's actually quite serendipitous. It is. It's very serendipitous. And there's no way Mind Pump would exist had we all met at 25. Just we, there's yeah. stuff that we need to go through. There's Exp- a lot of maturity that we've had to, you know, come to, to be able to like handle each one of our own like egos, personalities. Like we just don't really have that ego. Clash. And everybody pulls their weight equally. Yeah. It's yeah. equally, but differently. Right. It's different. It's, the, different. The, the, it's so it's, it's funny. Um, it took me a long time to learn this. When I used to argue and debate with people, my, my goal was to win. And I was very good at it. And this is why it was so hard for me to learn this. This particular lesson is I'm going to win this argument. But sometimes, uh, or not most of the time, actually. Have what, you met my wife yet? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> no, I She's haven't. She's also Sicilian. You guys Is she really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, you married a Sicilian, huh? Fucking crazy. God man. bless oh, wow. you. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, you must have some. I bet your kids are probably tough ones, huh? My daughter, yeah. She's special. Oh, Sicilian daughter. Could have fun with that one. <laughs> yeah. So, well, uh, here's the thing. Uh, no, all joking aside, um, when because we do. We get in do- debates and arguments quite a bit. But nobody's doing it because they're trying to win. Sure. We that's want a, the right answer. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful, right? Because and that's very. Listen, let me tell you something. That's like, hard. Oh well, you know, uh, especially when you have, you know, four alpha men yeah. who are. I mean, we are, and all in, uh, for with all for all intents and purposes on our own with other people, we're all alpha. We're all very confident. So you got four of us together. Yeah. And it's we, but we also have, and we all share this. There's a couple things that we share that are crucial because we're also very different. But there's a couple things that we share that are like, you know, people are interesting in that you need to have this basic foundational belief system, this basic scaffolding that you follow. And humans need that. We really do. And if for anybody who, who debates that, you can look at how bad people can behave when their scaffolding or their basic belief system is flawed. The 20th century is full of horrible, horrible acts that people did because their basic understanding was was flawed. And our basic understanding, or at least our basic scaffolding, there's two things that we have in common, one of which is integrity. This is something that very, first day we all met, we sat down, that was the first thing I identified. Like these motherfuckers are, they, integrity to them is, is number one, just like it is with me, to the point where um, call, it could be at, at, even at a fault. Well, we're going to be very brutally honest even if that means we're going to hurt people's feelings or whatever, and we're going to be true to ourselves. That's the other half of integrity. It's not just telling people about themselves. It's about on, trying to be as honest as possible. So on the other end of that is humility. So if I'm having an argument with Adam, for example, which oftentimes that happens, that me and him tend to butt heads on, on a lot of different things, and we'll argue about something. And it sometimes it requires a little humility for me to be like, all right, that motherfucker's right. Like I'm going to let, I'm, he's right. I'm going to have to follow on this particular topic. And I know the same things happen to him. It's happened to all of us. And those are the two things that I think really uh, allow us to work together. Cause if we didn't have those two things, it'd be very difficult. Well, I, I it's that. Like- and it's also, it's the growth mindedness. So like, sure. e- you know, each one of us, I think like Sal's mentioning, he, he's okay with being challenged and, you know, getting into this argument and realizing, you know, he may be wrong, you know, from that perspective. Which, we which all, is rare, by the we way. We all share that, though. <laughs> yeah, just, whatever, dude. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we all share that. We want to get better. You know, we want to get better in, in whatever it is that we're pursuing, whether it's uh, a side of the business, whether sure. it's, um, you know, communicating, uh, you know, for me specifically, too. Like, all these different things, I learn from them every day, and I feel like, you know, on some level, whatever we share and whatever we bring to the table with our unique characteristic, um, you know, we could all sort of pass that on and, and get better as a result and feel kind of like where we may yeah. be, you know. I feel the podcast contributes a lot to it because mm-hmm. each of you is probably put in your place very often with your guests because you're like, fuck, I don't know anything. Like you get right. a lot of brilliant people, right? Like how can you attach to your opinion when you got the experts sitting across the table from you telling you how it really is, right? Totally. I think that probably contributes to humility. Like I know for me, podcasting totally. has contributed to my humility. My like, God, I know nothing. Like right. when you think you know something, you're like, oh, the, you know, the more I learn, the, the, or the, yeah, the more I learn, the less I know, right? Yeah. You, you okay. learn to embrace, uh, well, here's what it is. I know um, that I'm wise because I know yeah, that I know nothing. There you go. Yeah. It, uh, you have to make friends with what you don't know. Okay. So a lot of people uh, make what they don't know an enemy. Uh, like I have to know everything. If I don't know something, that's a terrible, like, again, like I have to win this argument or. Well, it pokes at insecurities. Right. 
pokes right, right at the insecurity well, when you don't know. We, I mean, these are, my, honestly, honest to God, the most confident men I've ever met in my entire life. Like, mm. they're so confident in themselves that um, you know it when you're around people like that. You're a very confident individual. I can mm. feel that when we talk. That's why we bonded. Like, you know, there's we no like, man hug. there's no, yeah, well, there's <laughs> oh, yeah. no, there's no like competing, whatever. I have to behave a particular, we've met lots of people in this, in this podcast space that are like that where right away it's like, okay, this person's posturing because they obviously feel threatened mm -hmm. uh, by my energy. They're extremely confident individuals and we all love what we don't know. What I mean by that is when we're talking to a guest and they just said some shit that's the opposite of what I thought. We all thrive for that. I mean, yeah. you should see the conversations after we're done with the podcast when a guest leaves and we're sitting there like, are you fucking kidding me? My like, mind my, is blown. And I love that because right. right now, I'm better off than I was 10 minutes ago when yeah. I thought I knew everything. Right. You know? I and wish I had that with my podcast because like, I just finished with some guys and I'm like, God, I want to explore this for four hours deeper, right? You know, they're, 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 long, they're gone like, no, let's talk for another two hours, right? But you guys have that beauty of being able to discuss it and get uh, you know, get it all out. Oh, dude, I had, I've had so many of them. I talk about this one a lot because it was such a mind blow. It's just such a silly, stupid thing, but it was so mind blowing to me. We had Paul Check on our show, who's this, he's just one of the most smart, one of the most brilliant men you'll ever meet. He's also out there. So when you talk to him, you got to really pay attention because he can talk about so many different things. Super brilliant guy, also incredible performance. 55 year old guy who could do backstep lunges with over 300 pounds on his back. And he's just this incredible phenom. And we all ate dinner with him. And I'm watching him eat. And we serve him his plate. And then he puts his hands over his food like this. And he puts his head down. And he spends about 15 seconds with his eyes closed. And then he starts eating. And so I'm watching this. And I'm thinking, like, I don't know Paul was religious. I thought he was, I didn't know he was belonged to a particular. So when we get on the podcast, I asked him about that. I said, were you praying? Like, are you Christian or what is that? And he goes, no. He goes, I was asking the food if uh, it wanted to become a part of my body. I was asking my body if this is what it needed. I was asking my soul if this is what it wanted. And so I went through this whole process, basically going back and forth, asking different parts of him if this is what he, you know, is this the right thing? And at first I was like, well, that's fucking ridiculous. Like, and then I stopped for a second. Because anytime I have that kind of a reaction now, I try to stop, although I don't always catch it. And I stopped for a second and I said, hold on a second. Every culture, every major culture or most cultures cross-culturally has some kind of a ritual before eating. Every major religion has some kind of, and it's called praying, right? Every religion does this where you pray before you eat. Every major religion does this. Every practice in cultures and religions that never had contact with each other do this and it's lasted for thousands and thousands and thousands of years right. so there must be some kind of moral truth in this and so i stopped for a second and then i thought about modern context and i think about the lady who's trying to lose weight or trying to get better health or whatever and i think about her grabbing the pop tart and i think if she took 10 seconds to ask her body if she if this the, does if the, she's she, serving it. just that simple yeah. am i serving myself I, it, by doing just this just stop for a second the likelihood that she would eat that pop tart drops considerably. I don't think so. Most people would just say, yeah, I don't give, I don't really care. Cause most people don't care about themselves that much. Well, make the practice of it. Imagine right. if you made that a practice, what are you bringing? You bring in awareness to eating. Sure. And, 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 and it blew it's... my mind right there. I was like, holy shit. That's why people pray. People talk. About, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's why it exists. You talk about mindful eating and, and, you know, getting back to the neurophysiology of it. Obviously our, our uh, autonomic nervous system is developed for a reason and they call it fight or flight or rest and digest. So what needs to happen when we sit down to eat? We need to come out of fight or flight. We need to take a minute to go and allow your body to actually absorb what you're about to take in. So your body's evolved to, to make that part of it a necessity. That five minute prayer is, is necessary for your body to actually go now down into that parasympathetic You're thinking place. of the physiology, absolutely. Oh, but you're, it's an evolution, right? Like the, the autonomic same. nervous system has evolved for a reason. We huh. just put labels on things. Mm -hmm. So like, I got to slow down before I eat this. People don't realize like, that that part of the bot, the brain, that autonomics part of the brain developed before the part of the brain that makes us human, the sure. part of the brain that that gives us, that, uh, where consciousness arises from, or some people will debate it comes from. But anyway, the part of the brain that makes you a modern human developed much later. And so the primitive part is react. It's reactionary. It is animal. It is instinct. It's fast. It's now. And so you literally have to think about it to disengage it. You cannot, it cannot be an automatic process that disengage. So I can't just go into being in a parasympathetic state unless I go to sleep. Right. right. I have to consciously use the part of my brain that, you know, is saying, take a deep breath. 
Like another one for me was not drinking water when I eat. I used to drink water when I eat because I used to slam my food in between clients. So I chew, 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 swallow like I was taking a supplement, right? Now I have no, no, no water with me. I just eat uh, my food and now I have to chew a lot more and think mm-hmm. about it. And my digestion has improved right. tremendously from such a stupid, small, you know, little thing. Right. Well, think of the other time of the day when we pray, right? Right before bed. So what do we try to do? Take your body out of fight or flight. Come into wow! I didn't, even, I didn't even realize that. Mm-hmm. Holy shit! Yeah, it's so simple. Like I just, it, it, we've been doing it for thousands of years. Like take yourself out of this fight or flight. Spend five minutes being grateful to the world, being grateful to the energy, being grateful to God, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, hey, now my body's prepared for food or it's prepared for sleep. It's so simple, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we've been doing it for millions of years, but yeah, we get out of those practices because we're so busy. We, yeah, you know, I'd rather play Xbox before bed or something. <laughs> something that'll wire the file or look at my emails yeah, so I can not sleep. Right, that's, yeah. a, that's a good idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's funny you said that because um, th- this brings me to just a, a little, little segue. You know, we're talking about the, the the part of the brain that makes us human. It's the part of the brain that can choose because the animal side of us doesn't. And the difference between humans and animals is that animals act humans know they have a choice and they choose. So we can choose, like for example, um, are you a good person if you do good things because you don't know any better? Not really. A good person is somebody that chooses to do the right thing even though they can do the wrong thing. Um, Another side to that is, are you a good person if you're so scared of doing the wrong things that you do the right things? In other words, I don't steal because I don't want to go to jail. Fear of God. Versus I don't steal because it's the wrong thing to do. Very, very different, and it's all about having that choice, and it brings me to this particular question, and we're talking about spiritual growth, and I know you've been going, you know, this is a big part of your current evolution, and I hear a lot of people talking about, and you said something out there that I thought was fascinating, and I really agree with, you hear a lot of people talking about transcending the ego and and dissolving the ego, in which case, they're feeding you're becoming an animal, Mm. in fact, you're becoming an animal, no choice, I just act. You said something out there was, you didn't say dissolve the ego, you said understanding the ego and learning how to work with it or something along those lines. So what did you mean by that? Well, like it, like you said, you're not going to lose your ego. You know, we're talking about transcending the ego or leaving the ego, but you're not, it's there. It's, it's who you are. It's, you are the self-protective mechanism. That is the ego is always going to be there. You're always going to be the most important thing in your life. But I think the reality is, um, just making it your friend. And, you know, what my mentor says, ride your ego. He says like, use it when you need it and um, you know, try not to let it guide your decisions and guide your life. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> well, what it, what that's, it, a, that's a tight walk. That's right? a good one. Yeah, <laughs> no, man. That's what do they call it? The, 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 the road, the, the road less traveled or yeah. the, the, the straight and narrow. What does your ego love and what does your ego hate? Like if I were to point, if I were to poke at your ego right now, like what could I say right now that would just make your ego try to rise up and trigger it? Yeah, yeah exactly. I don't know. Super introspective right there, huh? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I still have an egocentric attachment to the way I look, obviously, after 20 mm-hmm. years. And I, I, I honestly don't know which direction to go with the way that I look. It's it's kind of an interesting thing, right? Because mm-hmm. like, I still am the, the head of a substantial fitness brand. Sure. Um, and I still want to be fit. I still want to look great. I still want to be muscular because I love it, right? I've always loved it. Um, but I'm trying to find the deeper purpose in that rather than – so now for me, the deeper purpose is, well, I want to be strong because I want to be able to do cool stuff. So I'm, I'm looking at it from perspective of uh, performance throughout now rather than uh, aesthetic. Well, it lies within – the answer lies within why you love it so much. Yeah. Why do I love the physique? Well, right. because it made me who I am, man. You know, bro, I'm this. I mean, yeah, you're, 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 I'm, you're preaching the choir, or talking to this. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I totally get it. But I mean, that when you, if you're seeking the answer of why that potentially could be still a a soft spot for the ego, is because the answer is you just gave it. It's because I love it. Well, right. what is it about it that I love it so much to the point that it could still sure. trigger a. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know that it would would make me insecure. Like I don't know, man. I just realized. Like if I said to you, like, man, you look like shit. Would that bother you? Yeah, I, th- I think so. It would. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Um, but I'm still, like, I'm still, man, 20 years of unconscious You don't, by the program. way, you look good. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what a dick, Sal. I'm being honest. Yeah. You look Thank good. You, man. Thank you, man. 20 years of unconscious programming to be the biggest human being on the planet and doing everything in my life to lead toward that one goal. 
and now try to unwind all that unconscious. Um, Good point. Yeah, it's it's a lot, man. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. So you know, especially well, your perspective's eating. fucked up. You, yeah. I mean, because let's be honest, you could not train for the next year, and you still actually look amazing. Thank you. So um, think about that. But I know in your head, it doesn't translate the same because you've been somewhere that mm-hmm. most people so will never go. I had that conversation yesterday. Was uh, you know, people are like, "Well, what are you what are you training for now?" Like, you're like, "Well, we only get in shape to do a photo shoot." I'm like, dude, the last thing I got in shape for was the Mr. Olympia contest. Like, do you think I'm inspired to go like get, look good on the beach or take a picture? Like, <laughs> that's not going to get me off my ass. It needs to come from inside. So I'm looking deeper. Like, well, why do I need to go get in shape? Why do I need to get? You know, is there a reason for me to get? Like, rather than some external, hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm going to feel good about myself. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I need dude, to, so you're looking at metrics I, now. Then, if you mention performance, are there any? Is there anything pulling you in that direction? Yes and no. Um, I, I want to do some endurance stuff. I want to challenge, you know, I can't, therefore I must. Uh, I want to challenge my mind because I see the value in endurance sports. I see the value of saying, I can't do a marathon. Oh, let's find out how to do mm. that. Um, but time-wise right now doesn't fit in my life. Um, I, you start a fire with your thighs, man. I would, if you, I ran, would if you argue, ran that far, yeah. I would <laughs> argue, so Team ben, Clydesdale. Let's do this. Yeah. I would argue that you're actually in the best shape of your life. Oh, like, sure. When you think mesi- sure. mentally, health wise, yeah, physically, so here's, here's spiritually, for, everything else like that. Here's a metric for you. When I retired from bodybuilding 18 months ago, I got my telomere test done. I had the telomeres of a 51 year old. Oh shit! Wow. Now I've got the telomeres of a 39 year old. So it's. In 18 months, you can make a substantial change. How do you get those tested, by the way? Uh, the blood test? N- n- no, saliva. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That's pretty that's Definitely pretty cool. get it done. So, yeah. I mean, am I in the best shape of my life? Yeah. I've like literally reversed 12 years off my life. Uh, just fasting, sleeping. Dude, I've never slept as a bodybuilder, right? Like I cut my teeth on being the guy like, fuck you. I can do it. Like yeah. at five o'clock in the morning, I'm going to squat 600 pounds. Let's go. Yeah. You know, if I can't, I must. And um, so telomeres. Like, you know, am I in the best shape of my life? Physically, I don't get like what I look like. It doesn't matter. Like I, I'm, you know, I can do cool stuff. My endurance is great. I can run with my kids, and uh, I'm 12 years younger than I'm still not at my age yet. But I'm 12 years younger than I was 18 months ago. So that's a good start. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. for I went through a, a bit of that process of, of you know, I worked out for aesthetic, worked out for aesthetic. Then I was forced to work out for health because my, 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 my gut just rebelled on me and I just, I lost 15 pounds and couldn't hold anything down. I thought I had Crohn's disease and, uh, I had, I had to make, I was forced to make that decision to train for health, um, and eat for health. Rather Tell me than, about forget- that, man. I'm very curious about that because people live, the, the term that, that is used is dread and people have this constant underlying dread that they mask with food and with you know, totally being mindless. Is that what you feel like that was? So were, were you, were you fearing something? Well, I a hundred percent. I mean, I had identified with being a, a big, strong guy, you know, big, strong guy, you know, work in fitness. This is what I love to do. And here I am now. And I thought I ate healthy, you know, I was eating chicken breast and oatmeal and whole grain and this, that, and the other. And here I am now I'm losing 15 pounds of muscle, look like shit. I'm pale. Don't have the energy. And now who am I? Pale what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, this is pale. Yeah. What are you talking about? Pale for me. Yeah. Um, and it was like, you know, who am I? Like, what am I? I've identified so strongly with this. It's being taken away from me. It was very depressing, very, very difficult. Luckily, I was surrounded by- But you're, you're talking about after this had him started. Yeah. Happening. I'm talking about what caused it. What caused- Oh, I treated my body terribly. Absolutely terribly. Force-fed myself. I took- Crazy amounts of supplements. Yeah, but I don't. Th- people do that for a long time to a much greater extent than you were. Do you think that's what it was? Uh, oh, I think that was. I think that was a big part. Of my, I mean, since I was fourteen. I mean, keep in mind, you know, I was a fifteen-year-old who would take a can of tuna fish, a chicken breast, so, raw eggs, milk, and I'd blend them together and drink them. To, man? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, we're talking about it's breakfast every morning, yeah, dude. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, I mean, I, I abused it, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, quote unquote, looking back, I thought I was doing the right thing. And as I'm sure millions of people are. Well, so if I go, if I unpack and I go deeper, um, so from a, phys- I can look at it both from a physiological standpoint and from an emotional standpoint. Yeah, look so, at the psychology. Right. So physiologically, it's pretty, it was very clear to me. Um, you know, as a kid, I was on antibiotics a lot. Yeah. Um, so that fucked up my microbiome. I overtrained like crazy since the age of 14, force fed myself, took lots of crazy ass supplements and designer steroids and did all these different things that were terrible for my body. My body rebelled from those physiological or or physical things. But then at the same time, 
I was in a marriage that was completely yeah, disconnected. There you go. True. I was completely disconnected. Um, you know, both me and my wife were not, I mean, we were partners in the sense that like roommates are, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, I did everything I thought I was supposed to do. So, you know, I grew up in a very conservative, tight Italian family and I married another conservative Italian woman and we did everything we were supposed to. And I bought a house at a very young age and I was an entrepreneur at 22 years old. And um, it was, uh, and I was miserable. I was so miserable, but I, I buried myself in uh, being in the things that I had control over, at least the things that I uh, had good control over, which was my work and my workouts. And that was pretty much it. And so when you combine and add all of that up together, the terrible sleep habits and diet and supplements and all that shit to drive this fucking body, and you combine it with this complete disconnect in my in my personal life and that kind of a disconnect you know when you when you live a lie and this, here's something that's interesting that I'm really really diving into now I'm somebody that values integrity tremendously uh, tremendously it's like my ultimate thing I, I want to be around honest people and I want to be very honest and I feel like if you if you live that way every time you make a decision if you just if you make that decision based on integrity the odds that it'll turn out better for you are much higher than not. But I, and what I'm also understanding is when you lie about small things, that everything starts to become a big lie. To yourself or to others? Everything. Both, everything. Both. Everything. So, um, you know, think about it when you're a kid. When you're a little kid and you tell your friend like, oh, yeah, I got, you know, I, I have, I'm a black belt karate. karate or yeah. I have. And then you, they come <laughs> to your house and like, hey, what about this? And then you create another lie and you create another lie. It's kind of like that. And you get your ass kicked. Yeah. Yep. Not as specific. <laughs> Not as specific, but it's it's very much like I thought you knew karate, you know. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, it's, but it but that's what ends up happening. So I'm living this lie of I'm in this relationship that I'm on the outside. We look like the perfect family, like you know, good looking wife and my kids and I got this house. Kids. And everything's you know what I, you know what it's supposed to be. But it was it was a total lie, and and part of that was lying to myself. Who I am? What do I truly value? You know. People who know me will, if you if you ask people to to uh, you know what is Sal like, like tell me about Sal or whatever, a lot of people will say that oh he's he's very much a thinker, you know, intellectual. He likes to do those kinds of things. The funny thing is, I because I identified so strongly with a lie, which was I am this big, strong, physical person. I almost completely, I mean, it was it's a part of me because it's a part of who I am, but I completely disregarded it. In fact, I didn't even feed it. Uh, and, to, and I'd rediscovered it later on. And the way I rediscovered it was, you know, I trained really, really smart, brilliant clients. And I went, I had some clients that were, this is an interesting story. I had some clients that were anesthesiologists, surgeons, and psychiatrists, and they were all friends. And there was about seven of them and they were clients of mine. We we're working out and they go, Hey man, we're going to go on this. We go on this annual trip and we go on the Delta and this houseboat and we all have a great time and we want you to come. And I was I, I looked up to these guys. Like they were super successful, super smart, like very, very confident. I'm like, holy shit. So I go out there with them and we're sitting there talking and everybody's, you know, we're having a great time. And they're like, man, you know, one of them stops and goes, fuck Sal, you're like a really smart dude. And I'm coming from this guy who is a brilliant, brilliant psychiatrist. I was like, you, you know, you're just saying that to be nice. Like there's no way. And then everybody starts telling me, and I start, and they start telling me why and how. And of course, I got the psychiatrist over there, and I was he's breaking me down. And it was a, 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 it was a crazy pivotal moment. And that, along with my body rebelling with me, along with me still being a growth oriented person, and as I'm growing, it's completely conflicting with this false person that I was, this false ego that I had. And at some point, when you grow enough, your ego starts to rise up to fight it. At some point, you're gonna have a clash, and something's gonna win. And I started Mind Pump. I met these guys. I sold my my wellness or fitness facility and got a divorce. And this all happened within the course of a year. And it was a very painful, crazy transformation. But that's listen, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm also a big fan of, of economics. And in the free market, when you skew the market signals hard enough, you're going to get a market correction at some point. It's just the longer you kick the, the, the harder you kick the can down the road, the correction is going to be much, much, much bigger. And that's what fucking happened to me is I had a market correction. <laughs> the, the stock market crashed. Everybody lost their job. Always economics. And it was a tough, it was a tough transition, but uh, now what, what was the catalyst for you, man? What was the catalyst for all of that? Well, for getting out because, because <laughs> there, there's, you know, there's a million men out there right now living that life. You know, um, a few things actually. 
So my wife, my, my wife at the time, I was very close with her family, love her family. And I care about her too. She's a great person, but loved her family. And the pe- in, in her family, good people, love her brother. He's like my younger brother and everybody. But her mom was a very special individual. Um, somebody that you will, you'll meet maybe once in your life. Truly a wonderful, wonderful, loving altruistic in the in the truest sense human being and she got diagnosed with terminal cancer while I was while I was married and this was very tough it was very very tough for everybody and she trusted me very much and you know doctors basically like we can't do anything there's nothing we can do and she turned to me and she said Sal she goes uh, and I told her I said listen anything you need I'm going to be there and I'm going to help you with it. I'm going to go with you to doctors appointments and she was so grateful and she uh, she told me she says I don't know what to do, so I'm going to let you tell me what to do. So she put that that trust in me. That's deep. Fucking hard. Yeah. Fucking hard because she died. Yeah. Didn't work. Now, she lived, you know, she was supposed to survive for three months and then die. And she made it over a year and a half. And through that period of time, you know, she ended up going on hardcore chemo, which was a huge regret of mine because that was, on. you know, everybody was like, should she do it? And she looked at me to make the final decision and out of fear, I said, let's, let's try it. And it was a, it was, it was bad decision. And, but then she tried other things and it, of course, you know, fate had it that she, she didn't make it. And that was a very difficult transition. That was a very difficult period. Actually had some, some, and there was a lot of learning lessons. One of them was, you know, um, I put that on myself and then I put on myself that she didn't make it. It was very, very difficult. Um, and her being gone, and all that pain, I started examining everything. And I think the same thing happened to my wife at the same time. And we had some really, really tough conversations. I think there was resentment there between you two, you guys? Like Bet- between you and your wife? Oh, tremendous. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, married for 15 years. Together since we were 16. So you, you want to talk about- the Resentment over the death. No, no. In fact, that brought us closer because she saw how much I cared about uh, the well-being of her mom and mm-hmm. how much I took care of everybody. Because I put the whole family on my back. Everybody was a mess. And I took that responsibility, and I did suffer the consequences of it physically, as a result of that, um, in the for, in the form of like you know post traumatic stress in some in some cases. Um, but uh, she 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 appreciated me with that and so for that. And um, no, we we had some tough conversations because I think when you're faced with a tremendous amount of pain and something that you can't control, um, you can either hide. And shelter yourself and become this mean, bitter, callous person who doesn't want to ever be hurt again. Or you can uh, grow from it and understand that uh, all life is is tragic. All life has, uh, you know, is tough. And there's there's beauty to that. There's a lo- there's a lot of good to that as well. So I grew from it. My wife didn't uh, at the time. She she. <sighs> you know, went in on her own and we had a lot of tough conversation. Her brother grew tremendously. Her brother, uh, was a bit of a selfish, um, you know, egocentric individual after his mom died, became this incredible human being. I think that's one of the reasons why, uh, she had to go. I think it was to transform everybody. And so we had these tough conversations, these real conversations. And the day I made my decision to leave was my decision. It was done. Like I'm going to leave. We both decided it. Neither one of us went back on it. Neither one of us sat down and said, you know, hey, maybe maybe we're not doing the right thing. No, we we made our decisions. One week after I walked out of the house, Mind Pump monetizes. One week after. It wasn't planned. It's just we all decide, hey, let's, I think it's time to start selling programs. Fucking Mind Pump starts blowing up. Um, I meet a young lady shortly afterwards who, at this point, I was in no way, shape, or form did I ever want to, to uh, meet somebody else. I was totally in the mindset of, I am focusing on my family and I'm focusing on work and myself and that's it. And I meet this young lady that absolutely uh, blew my mind and fell in love with her and I'm with her and I'm a better father now. I mean, I I examined how I was as a father. I was very loving and hugging and kissing with my kids, but I wasn't very involved. Mm -hmm. Now I'm far more involved uh, involved as a parent. So um, it was a a very hard and fast transition, but very grateful for it. Um, But I think I could have grown at a slower, easier pace had I allowed myself to do so. <laughs> sure. But rather than get hit with the rock in the there's face. There's beauty you know? in that, right? There's sure. beauty in the fact sure. that, uh, you know, there's people out there living a life and they don't realize what the other life could be. You know, and now you're living this great life. You're making an impact in people. You're making a greater impact in your kids. And, you know, you couldn't see that before. 
because it was being blocked by your focus on perhaps that bad relationship. <sighs> but so if people in that relationship there, they could see the potential of, you know, what you could be living outside of these negative relationships. You're not doing anything when you're living a lie. You're not, because part of the reason why I did it is because I had kids. Mm -hmm. So How old are your kids? Uh, my son's 12 and my daughter's eight. And um, I'm like, I'm not going to get a divorce because that's not good for kids. I know the statistics on divorce with kids. I know what happens. And, you know, I'm going to do this for my kids. I'm going to stick around for my kids. But uh, you are not doing anybody any favors and you're not benefiting anybody, especially your kids, if you are not being truthful to who you are. Now, if you're truthful and you're honest and you're you who you are and your spouse is that way and you guys work together, that's the best, right? But if you both reach a point where you're like, this is, I have to be who I am and it doesn't work and you still stick around, that is, uh, that's not good. That's not good for your kids. Crippling. It's not good for you. It's crippling. And I was going to raise two dysfunctional children if I continued down that path. As loving as I was, as much as I love my kids, as much as I thought I was sacrificing for my kids, the reality was, is I was hurting them. But the, the irony of that is I didn't leave to say it for them either. I left for me. It was after I left that I realized wow, I really did a good thing for my children because what the way I was before as a dad, I wasn't I wasn't a bad dad, but you can't fake shit. I think kids can, can sense that stuff. Totally, you know? man. They totally can sense that can. stuff. So it's really, really crazy. And, yeah. you know, we talk about kids being your ultimate teachers. You love your kids enough to face your darkest demons. That's what will drive you. I'll tell you that much right now. That will drive the fuck out of you. There's an irony right there, man. So um, I, we may have talked about this in the last podcast, but I think my kids saved my life, man. Like I was so single-mindedly focused on becoming Mr. Olympia that there was nothing that was going to detract from that ever women money. Like I was full on going to be Mr. Olympia. The only thing that could have stopped me was a child. One wasn't even enough. I had to have two. <laughs> and then only then after I, my daughter was born, did I go, God, I got to get the hell out of this. So I literally believe I would be Mr. Olympia. And then I would have shortened my life because I was at that point in my career where if I wanted to take it to the next step, um, I needed to, to go a little bit deeper, right? Like I hadn't, there was still another gear there that I hadn't really dived into as a bodybuilder. Um, and I, I could have, do you mean that literally too, by gear too? Is, I mean, is that really yeah, like yeah, what you're thinking? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. is so, there, is there a, a, a kind of a threshold where a lot of the well, guys, I don't know what anybody else is doing. I know what I was willing to do and I know I hadn't gone there yet. Like mm -hmm. I hadn't gone anywhere near what I know what other people are doing or what I know I, I would, what would take me to that next level. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I didn't because, like you know, like I don't need to do this anymore. Why am I doing this? I started questioning why am I doing this, and I didn't need to do it. And it was literally like because I had two kids that saved my life. And at the time, there was a bit of resentment, uh, unconscious resentment toward my kids for ending my career. And then I looked at it, and I was like, you know, thank you. I'm so grateful for you saving, literally saving my life, man. Like you guys, you could imagine what a professional body. I, I was the most. Um, single-mindedly focused human being on the planet. Like you couldn't detract me. Like I, like you heard the conversation I had with my wife when we were when we first met. Like this is what I do. If you can make it better, awesome. If not, there's the best. arguably the most selfish sport that exists on the planet. I believe. Yeah, for I, sure. I, I, when you talk That's about all day, <laughs> yeah, because because of yeah. the amount of focus that it takes on the nutritional aspect yeah. along with the the work, because every sport takes tons of work. Sure. So you could argue there's someone out there out working me out on the field or in sure. the gym or something like that, but. But it's Do, 24 hours a day. Right. Mm -hmm. when, when that, that's always the thing is like, you know, as a fighter, if you want to go have a beer, if you want to go have some Doritos or something, go eat your, you know, we'll get back on track tomorrow. But as a bodybuilder, you can't do that stuff. And it's 24 hours a day. Right. Did you yeah. feel, because uh, uh, you said resentment, which I thought was, uh, that's a, to be able to say that uh, as a parent, which by the way, uh, if you're a parent and you don't, you haven't battled with resenting your kids, you're not being fucking honest. Mm. Okay. Yeah. It's a fact. Um, so here you are super focused. If you get in my way, I'm going to fucking run you over. That's literally your mentality. I resented my wife massively, as wow. you can imagine. And my kids. Were they planned? Yeah. Was the first pregnancy planned? No, man. Uh, we, we weren't even in the same state. Like, it was Holy shit. So here you are super focused. She's like, Hey, guess what? Yeah. I'm pregnant. <laughs> wow. How did you handle that shit? All right. I'm moving. <laughs> oh, wow. Yep. Wow. Yeah, we were basically broken up. <laughs> Holy Toledo. Like, yeah, so because I was like, yeah, no, I, I got to get focused. Right, I got the Olympia coming. Holy up. shit! Wait a second, back up here. You you married the woman that you broke up with, but then had a kid with, and you guys are still here today <laughs> in a healthy relationship. Yeah, 
We're wow. Still, we're still wow. married. That's, wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, dude, how do we miss that? Like, in all the conversations we <laughs> exactly. had. That's well, fucking that crazy. How long ago was that now? Seven years. Oh, wow. Right, coming up on eight. Yeah. Oh, no, seven years. It was 2011. Yeah, a lot of... That'll put you on the fast track of growth right there. Yeah, man. Yeah. One way or another. <laughs> yeah, you can be as committed as you want to something, but, you know, so the first one was like, oh, it's the sun, you know, it's a huge curveball, but I can deal with this, right? Mm. I can keep going. You can still hit this one. Did you immediately yeah. just think, wow, okay, uh, what happened in, in your childhood and everything? Like, you just wanted to be, like, the best father immediately. There was no way that I wasn't going to be a great dad, right? Yeah. So my first inclination, to be honest, was like, fuck this girl. I'm, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Mm. And that lasted about three seconds. And I was like, no, like, cause the first is like, like she did it on purpose kind of thing, right? She's trying to trap me. Your first thought, right? Mm. Oh yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a successful guy. I'm, I'm doing well. I'm, you know, on this path and this chick is trying to trap me down. Um, and then I was like, well, regardless what her motivation was, this is still my responsibility. So I moved, <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, started raising a son, and then we went on another vacation after the Mr. Olympia that year, and my my daughter was conceived. Uh, so at that point, I knew that bodybuilding was no longer in the cards for me because with the son, man, I felt like I could, like I said I could keep going. But uh, once I had a daughter, I couldn't be the same human being in the gym. You can't you can't go home and and be this wonderful, loving, caring dad with this angel of a human being, and go to the gym and be a focused, crazed killer machine. <laughs> yeah it's very hard very, very hard um so i just was like well i couldn't find that anger anymore man i couldn't find that like pissed off button anymore right right right. Like, yeah. which I, and i used to cut my teeth on that like i used to be really good at that like if, if you come near me i'm gonna crush you i couldn't do that anymore how much does your your wife feed your flame and like are there certain things that she that she really brings to the table that have definitely made you the man you are today my wife is my behind my kids she's my greatest teacher and uh, I think that's because I brought her into my life because I had a lot to learn. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what that looks like yet, but I know uh, it's teaching me patience. It's teaching me um, to be a better communicator. Are you receptive when she calls you on your bullshit? Um, yeah. Yes, I am. Um, so my wife is a terrible communicator. Mm. So I don't only need to be a better communicator for me. But I need to be a better communicator for her um, to the point that I need to articulate myself in such a calm way that she understands and allows her to open up to me. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic. Um, but yeah, like there's a lot to be learned there for me, man. Um, you know, and, and at first there was a lot of finger pointing, right? It was a lot of, um, you know, she's this and she's that. And then you realize well, like, okay, well, what do I need to learn in this? Um, so we're both going through a lot of learning opportunities. That's um, tough. I rely heavily on my partner to be that other great source of communication because I know I have my own tendencies to. I, I have people in my life who are not my wife who call me on my bullshit. Mm. Thank goodness. Right. Um, I'd call you on your bullshit. You know, we, you. we're friends like that. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> Adam <laughs> loves doing so, that, by the way. <laughs> I actually like to speak about that. So there's, there may be some people out there. So as a bodybuilder, man, I live the most sheltered life to the point that um, – I, I almost felt like I was recluse and I went out and I was like, I fucking hate this. I hate the way that I have, I have no one to share these conversations with. So I literally went out and hired somebody, um, a life coach, just talked to once a week. And I was like, Hey man, you know what? I don't have a lot of good people in my life right now. I need, I need to talk to you once a week. And I'm going to pay you because I know your time's valuable. He's a friend of mine. So I'm going to pay you because I know your time's valuable. And I want to, you know, I want, I want you to show, I want to show you that I value your time and, and uh, I want your attention. I don't want to make this a chore for you. Um, so for anybody out there who's living that life, who's like, I don't have anybody well, that maybe like, honestly, that was like the last straw for me. And I had nobody in my life is 2012. My son was just born. I didn't have anybody to talk to. My wife wasn't that person for me at the time. And, uh, you need somebody, man, like getting, it's so important to, you know, the five people rule, right? The five people you surround yourself with. And if, if it's like diapers and, um, you know, preschool moms, that may not be the best opportunity for growth. So. I literally went out and hired, you know, at the time, the greatest man I knew. And I said, hey, man, what's it going to cost me to talk to you every Thursday? <laughs> um, so we've been doing it since, man, six years. Um, every week, talk to him on Thursdays. And for anyone out there who's, like I say, who's living that life of, man, I don't really have anybody to help me grow, to challenge me to, you know, call bullshit on my words. This guy was the king of calling bullshit on my words. Mm. Still is. Um, the words you choose, um, 
you know, that that's where we start usually the, the words you choose the in your unconscious and in your verbal exchanges uh, say so much about what's going on in your unconscious. Right? How, how does that quote mm. go? Be careful of your thoughts to become your words. Be yeah, careful yeah, yeah. of your words to become your actions. Be careful yeah. of your actions to become your character. Yep. That's true, man. And like the way you choose words, you know, if you, if I ask you a question about your wife or your girlfriend and, you know, I have to versus I get to, or I have to versus I want to. And like looking at how you choose says so much about what's actually happening. Mm. Um, so he's that guy. He's like, so talk to me. And he's just like, you hear what you said there? I'm like, fuck. <laughs> so Unpack just, that. Yeah. Right. So that, that's the beauty of it, right? It's like having that skill goes so far um, in, in calling you on your BS. And that's important, man. If you want to grow, you got to be ready to get uncomfortable and, and trust somebody to call you on your BS. You know, oh, I have to do this. Or she does this and she does that. I'm right. like, whoa, 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 yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up. That's your perspective, right? Your perception. So. Right, right. Yeah, growth growth doesn't come from being comfortable because otherwise there's no, there's no reason to grow. It only comes from being uncomfortable and because uh, that's how it happens. What makes you most uncomfortable now? Not being a good dad. Mm. Still. Still. So, Isn't yeah. that an interesting one? That's mm -hmm. sales insecurity. Oh, I, I mean, I'll tell you what. I think mm -hmm. most parents, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big one, like... If you, if, I'll tell yeah, you but what. That's, that's a big one for you, and I'll oh, tell you why it's a big well, one for you. Because you're, the well, uncertainty because you're, you're an incredible dad, mm -hmm. and I have a better perspective for you as a guy who's seen thousands of other dads, and then see the way you are with your mm -hmm. kids, and you're an incredible father. But yet, if I ever see you get triggered, frustrated with anything, it's if it's taking away from you potentially being a good dad, oh, yeah. right, or somebody who's influencing your kids in a negative way. Right, and oh, that's yeah. the life that I'm living now, man. It's mm -hmm. like I don't like that's why I say I'm protecting my kids, quote unquote. It's like. I just want them to be great humans, man. And, mm -hmm. I, and I don't want somebody to fuck up their unconscious because I'm being so conscious of not like, I'm like letting them be these free spirits and letting them do whatever they want to do. Letting them be, um, you know, be the kids that are allowed, be the kids that are running, be the yeah. kids that are like, I'm like, go be free. Uh, and then you have some other a-hole that's, you know, inflicting their unconscious beliefs on my kids. And that mm -hmm. pisses me off. Yeah. That's a tough one. I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading right now on that. And um, two things. One was the first one that I said, which was don't try to protect your kids. Try to make them strong. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. now what that means is... Uh, you Punch know, them in the nose. <laughs> exactly. No. <laughs> it means, you know, sometimes you you are the one that's hugging them and coddling yeah. them. And sometimes you're challenging them because and, yep. and, that's what makes them strong. Yep. And the other part, the other one, which was fucking mind-blowing for me, was never do for your kids what they can do for themselves. Yeah. And I read that and I was like, holy shit, that makes a lot of sense. Like how yeah. much, like you are robbing your, every time you do something for them that they can do, mm -hmm. you're robbing them of the opportunity to grow, not just grow, but be confident in their independence yeah. of, as yeah. being human beings. What's being. great is when like my youngest will catch me on that and it'll be something where, dad, I can do that. Yeah, I can do this, dad. Watch me do this. And, he, and he's literally trying to show me and prove to me. And meanwhile, I'm trying to hush, you know, rush everything and get everything going where you know, he's literally trying to show me these new skills that he's acquired. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge, man, because you, you do, you want to be a part of the process with them, but you have to let them learn. So I'll say that one more time. Which one? But the kids. Oh, uh, never do for your kids what they can do for themselves. That's it. I got you on video. Uh, <laughs> you show that to wifey. That was a moment. Yeah, um, time. Go, you're going on social media. Yeah. yeah. So, so here's the thing. Like, uh, so I was raised uh, a bit sheltered. Uh, I, I said earlier, my mom did everything for me, um, and she's like that with all her kids. Very loving, by the way. It's not coming from from you know. It, it's all because sure. she's a loving, good person. And and man, I, I tell you what, I didn't know how to do a damn thing. I mean, I moved out, and you know, luckily, I'm an ambitious fucker so i went out at you know at, at at 20 years old or you know no i'm sorry 21 years old i went and bought a gym and i moved out and didn't know i didn't know how to operate anything in the house i put liquid soap in the dishwasher because i looked at the thing and i'm like oh okay and i put some dawn in there and i turn it on and i go sit down watch tv and next thing you know <laughs> it's, it's a, a fucking bath. mexican phone party <laughs> in my house you know i'm like oh shit like i, feel I had like to, we've all done that though, dude i had point. to learn how to wash clothes for my neighbor See, and I then didn't do that. it was just a bunch of <laughs> I yeah when you, i was a kid i was, though, I was when forced I was to kid. do all that shit yeah. when i was seven eight years old and I you're mean, very self-reliant as a result yeah, so, right yeah, yeah, yeah i definitely i did i did all that i learned all those mistakes early on in life so i crack yeah, exactly. up when i see that shit yeah man. no you're just i think you're just because life is uh, is hard it's hard for everybody it's tragic shit happens 
And if I can prepare my kids to make them strong, resilient, hardworking, and to be honest, yeah. then their odds of being, you know, finding peace. Because people always say, find your happiness. No, happiness is a, it's an emotion. Like, you know, you yeah. can't be happy all the time. That's bullshit. But you can find peace. You know, peace yeah. is being okay with the challenges. Joyful. Of life. I, I call it joy, man. It's jo- like, yeah. You know, absolutely. Having having that inner feeling of like, <sighs> that's it. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Piece and if I can te- raise my kids like that, then I know yeah. that you also you also teach them uh, how to win and be successful really well too. That I think is different than a lot of people. I think a lot of people that are proud of their kids because they accomplish something uh, get so caught up in the moment and celebrate the moment where you see that as a teaching opportunity. And I think that that's missed by a lot of parents oh, too. Yeah. So I think that advice is oh, absolutely. Like, like if if so, my son is uh, exceptional um, at academics. Very, very, very bright uh, kid. He's in uh, seventh grade. When they test him, um, his reading comprehension is college level. Uh, at, in math, he's the highest level he could possibly be in, and the kid finishes. I mean, he does his tests, you know, in ten minutes, and it's just not a problem. So when I talk to him about his academics, I never tell him how smart he is. I never say to him, like, no. you're the smart. I always tell him, like, hey, look, uh, I can tell you worked hard at this. Or you're doing your best. Yeah. Dude. Or, you know, you know, son, I can see that math comes easy to you. Yeah. And I want him to think about that. Like, what do you mean come easy to me? Like, I want him to, to know that, like, oh, I should probably challenge myself. And I told him that. I said, you know, when we, when we put you in and when you go to high school, because we're looking at high schools right now. I said, I would be, I told him, because he said, I'm going to get straight A's. I said, that's great. I said, but, I, but I'll be honest with you. I said, if I saw you in a, in a class that challenged the heck out of you and you got a B, I'd be more proud than if you got an A in an easy class. And I left it at that because I want him to, to embrace the challenge. And so when he succeeds at something, I praise his work, eth- his work ethic or I talk about humility um, like, you know, if you're, okay, fine. You're the smartest one in class with this particular test where you do the best with the test, make sure, tr- help other people and don't brag about it and be, and have humility. And then on the flip side in athletics, he's not the best at all. He's, he takes after his father. And so there's a lot of teaching lessons there too, about, uh, being the hard about practicing, working hard, not making excuses because, oh, I missed that shot, but it's because this, you know, the, the floor in this basketball court's really slippery. No, you missed that shot because you need to practice more. You're not as good as you could be. And we talk about that. And also about playing on a team. You know, we had an experience where he was playing on a team. And, and this was, there's a couple times where he's, he's really uh, made me so proud. They were in a tournament and they were playing in a tournament and they were doing very well. They got second place. And on the way home, he goes and was quiet, you know, and he goes, <coughs> yeah, he goes, the coach didn't have me play that much in that game. And I didn't say anything. I said, yeah, I saw that. And he goes, it's because uh, I'm not one of the better people on the team. And the score was really close and he wanted to keep the better people on the team. And I said, how does that make you feel? I want to see what his reaction was. He goes, well, I think he made the right decision because at that moment we wanted to win as a team. And I said, you know what? I said, I agree with you. And I said, and also understand that your role on that team sometimes, many times doesn't mean that you're the top scorer or you're the best player. Sometimes it means you're supporting your, the players from the bench or you're showing them that you're trying hard and it makes them try even harder. And so it was just a great, you know, opportunity. And my daughter does the same thing with me. She'll, you know, my daughter will, well, she's got a temper and she'll lash, she'll, she'll, you know, scream or yell or hit her brother. And so I've learned to, when she does something, first off, when she does something like that, when she shows, when she displays violence, I stop it immediately because that's unacceptable. But then I tell her, listen, uh, if you if there's something that you want to communicate, you have to communicate it in a way that people want to listen to you. If you yell or you scream or you throw something, nobody's going to want to listen to you. And then you're going to be all alone screaming and angry and whatever. Mm-hmm. So when you're ready to, dis- to, to communicate to me, you can come talk to me. But for now, because you're being loud and whatever, you're not going to be with the rest of the family because nobody wants to be around that. So you go over there. And so now she's learned to use her words. So she'll get angry. And they'll say, use your words. And then she'll calm down and she'll tell me, I don't like it when you blah, 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 blah. And I'm, it's, it's, so these are the lessons that I really live for as a parent. It's funny because I, I, I'm so much better now, probably because of the insecurity of, you know, getting divorced and wanting to be a better parent. So yeah. there's a good, there's a good side to that as well. Beautiful, man. Yeah. I always, everything comes back to what's the message you're trying to get across with kids, right? Like, I just want them to know that I love them. You know, like if, if everything you say comes from that perspective, 
nothing like they, nothing they do will ever be wrong or like you'll always be from i'm trying to teach you rather than reprimanding you know, mm-hmm. i think that's what a lot of parents do wrong is and i learned that from stephen covey is is you know if your kids are doing something bad most people are you know well, don't do that or stop doing that i'm like like tr- let them know that you love them and then everything else will be okay dude it, 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 one it's of the amazing biggest... how much that transcends into business oh it's the same yeah. and, and leadership mm-hmm. it's the mm-hmm. same when you talk about trying to motivate a staff of people yeah. and and recognizing some of them are going to scream and lash out and ah! yeah. <laughs> others are going to be quiet and not say anything but then inside be angry you know what i'm saying like it's the same thing as learning how to get them to it's, all communicate it's so funny to it's you. one of the one of the biggest fears that dads have is the, the macho fear right that their daughter is going to you know, sleep around with a bunch of dirt bags and super prim. You know, this is like a male fear we have of our of our of our <laughs> our kids, especially our daughters, right? She knew porn. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh no, she's gonna you know she's gonna go go on a motorcycle with some dude and you know whatever. But <laughs> it's the, always a motorcycle. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. the stereotype, right? Fuck. But the you know the irony of that is if you don't want your daughter to seek out that kind of attention and to be promiscuous in ways that are unhealthy for her and all that stuff. All you got to do is show her that or just have her be super secure with her dad. Like if she's secure as fuck with her dad, like she knows you love her and you're there and you're, but you're firm and you're, you're not a pushover or whatever. She's not going to go seeking it out with other people. And that's the whole irony of it all is like you try and teach something. It's funny. I'm reading about, about, you know, a lot about uh, raising children recently. And as a parent, you tend to think about all these big moments where you can really impact like, Oh, here's a big moment or something that's going to happen. Right. So I, but doesn't matter. No, the author was talking about how he goes, listen, think about all the times you wake your kids up and you, you know, get them ready for school. It takes 30 minutes of your day. You get them ready. You make them breakfast. You would and you, you know, scoot them out the door to school. He goes, now add that up over the course of their life. That's like, you know, five years of interaction with you just getting up in, in the morning for school. Those are the moments that have the big impacts on yeah. your kids. It's not that once in a great while you throw a big birthday party and you show your kid how much you love them. It's all those little things that you do every single day. Yes, sir. Blew my fucking mind. Mm-hmm. Changed everything. Yep. Changed everything. So. Yeah, man. It's every minute. And I was. I think I was talking about. I took my son every weekend to. Uh, we got like a daddy daddy Sunday, right? We take him onto the national park, and as long as I have great connected time with him once a week, that's all he needs, man. Like, we're, we have such a great relationship, such a great connection. I still spend time with him during the week, but I want to make sure we have that special time where we just connect. My daughter's still too young to do that, but. Eventually, I'll just do one day with each of them. And and then, because we get so caught up with like trying to spend all the time. <laughs> just give them some good time. That's right. How old How old's your boy? My son's six. And six years four, old. Yeah. How are you? Oh, he's young. But are you, do you feel comfortable being affectionate with your boy as he gets older? Oh, for sure, man. Okay. Even if he's, a, as a young man, you're not going to have a problem. Man, every Saturday morning, we wake up and I put on the music and we dance. And I, and, and <laughs> we just <laughs> That's dance great. ridiculously, right? And, and, and I just show them nothing but love and i because i didn't get it and maybe i'm going that's a hard cycle to break dude i know i know it is man um but that's all it is is like fun having fun letting them know it's okay to be goofy let them know it's okay to be silly to dance to sing even though you don't feel like you have a great voice or like just sing and and dance and let out that inner joy because we all need it we all let the need to let that go because we're afraid of it so that and that little bit of time and connecting goes a long way man Fuck. Mm-hmm. Well, I tell you what, man. Another great conversation with you, brother. Thanks, boys. Yeah, yeah, you make the trip worth it, for sure. Yeah. You know we had to fly. You know we had to fly. We, our flight got delayed. We ended up st- <laughs> a little red eye. Actually. Yeah, we were fl- we had no sleep for like two days in a row. So. Uh, yeah. yeah. Feel but better today though. For we're because feeling it, good now. Yeah, at least you're here, right? Now you get yeah. to relax. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. That's great. Anyway, appreciate you uh, talking with us. Thank and you. I think so. we did a long podcast, so maybe we can do something with this on maybe both we, both yeah, shows. Perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All yeah, right, man. I think so. Thanks, boys. Right on.